wrote an editorial saying he's an older guy, leave him alone. And when, when the Anthony DeVito showed up there and spoke, he looked at these kids and he said, what the hell gives, oh, he said, I'm not Jewish, what the hell gives you the right to say leave this guy alone? Mm -hmm. yeah. And Kingman Brewster, by the way, let him retire with full uh, pension. Right, right. The, uh, the, the, um, the ex post facto question, the ex post facto question is a very complicated issue. Um, I actually end up having to devote basically a chapter of the book to this question. And one of the reasons that makes it uh, so complicated is that um, I think I mentioned at the, uh, during the talk that he was in Germany, he stood trial as an accessory to murder. He did not stand trial in Germany as an accessory to crimes against humanity. He did not stand trial as an accessory to genocide. And you might ask yourself, well, why did the German prosecutors use an ordinary murder statute instead of a genocide statute or crimes against humanity. Both of those uh, incriminations are part of the domestic legal code of Germany. So in principle, they were available to German prosecutors. And the answer is exactly as where your intuition is pushing you. The German prosecutors said, well, we don't really want to use these uh, incriminations because we believe that doing so would be tantamount to um, ex post facto. And for those of you who are familiar with, I mean, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the note, there's an ex post The idea is that uh, there's something fundamentally unfair about trying someone for a conduct that was not a crime at the time that it was uh, engaged in. And to the extent that genocide and crimes against humanity were first recognized as crimes after the war, the argument is there'd be some kind of prosecutorial bar against using those crimes for the purposes of mounting uh, prosecutions uh, in Germany. My own feeling. My own feeling is that was a disastrous uh, decision on the part of German prosecutors. Uh, German prosecutors, the result of that was, and I talk about this a lot in the book, is um, German prosecutors basically then had to kind of shoehorn Nazi atrocities into this domestic murder statute. Now, ultimately, in the Damiano case, they kind of figured out a very clever way to use this murder statute, nevertheless, to deal with this kind of genocidal type of crime. But for decades, there were lots of prosecutorial disappointments and pros uh, prosecutorial um, dead ends that resulted from having to shoehorn this history into an ordinary merger statute rather than using crimes against humanity and genocide. And the reason, the reason that they really kind of um, turned their back on genocide and crimes against humanity as prosecutorial tools has a lot to do, it wasn't simply that they um, wow, we really want to be fair to these ex-Nazis. Um, a lot of it also had to do is they, Germany turned very strongly against the uh, Allied War Crimes trial, trial Program in the 1950s. Uh, there's an expert here on that, this, and that's a Weinguss sitting right over there. Um, and um, and uh, so one of the things is the German jurists came to associate crimes against humanity and genocide with the victor's justice imposed on them by allied occupiers. And I think that was one of the reasons why they then reached this conclusion, which I think was a very important conclusion, that uh, they couldn't use genocide or crimes against humanity because of concerns about retroactive application. Um, what about Kingman Brewster and that incident with that? Oh, you don't know about that? <laughs> I was at Yale way after. Oh, Kingman, way after. There's a question here. Um, <laughs> hello. Oh, I yes. Have a question. Were you calling the people on the call? Are you calling them? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I Can came you speak late. To the I came late, so I may not have. You okay. may have cut yeah. off. I recently read Eric Lichtblau's book. Yes. Um, he dedicates a chapter to Ivan Domingo. Yeah. And it's pretty clear from his exposition that there were severe and serious doubts about Ivan Domingo and his identity as this guard that they were going to try him for in Israel, but that Israel needed a show trial and that they went ahead with that trial. You said that it took a long time because of the slow workings of the legal system in America from the time that he was, you know, to, to the time that he was tried. Yeah. 
Um, but because of those serious doubts, the OSI was completely, as I understood it, discredited um, after the Demian the new trial. And then it almost seems to me like it was absolutely necessary to, to, to put him in, in, on trial again in order to exonerate yeah. the system. Right. I'm not sure I, I, I find the, the legal circuitous yeah. thinking yeah. very problematic. Right. I, I don't think we would want to be tried under that kind of thinking. Right. And yeah. associated by, by associate, you know, this, this, this a crime by association uh, is, is, is very right. tough. This is war, this is a, war, a, a prisoner of war that we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say two things in response to that. Um, first is this notion of uh, the guilt by association. I would say that's a pretty serious mischaracterization of what the court said in Munich. They're not saying it's like, uh, and this is some critics actually of the conviction said a similar thing to what you're saying. They're saying um, he's been convicted as a member of this organization. That's not what he was convicted of. It was not membership, it was function. It was, we can say with absolute certainty that if he served as a death camp guard, he had to be an accessory to murder because that's what his job was. But he so, didn't but apply actually, for that excuse job. Me, excuse me, excuse me. Let, me, let me just, let me just continue. The second point that you make is a point about voluntariness. Now again, you might not be convinced by the conclusion that the court re uh, reached about the involuntary service. And I think it is fair to say that is it possible to imagine in you know, history by counterfactual a little bit of a dicey enterprise. But if, you know, if Dominion had grown up in, uh, I don't know, in uh, Stanford, Connecticut and lived a nice life, would he have been a kind of a nice upstanding citizen? Sure, it's possible to imagine that. I don't believe that he was a particularly cruel person. There's no reason to believe that he was. Maybe he was, but there's no reason to believe it. But nevertheless, the question is, was his service, even if he faced difficult choices, difficult choices is very different than no choice at all. And I think it's fair to say that he made a choice ultimately remain in service as a death camp guard. Ma'am, I, I, I'm not going to debate you right now. I'm just offering a counter to the argument that you're making. The third point that you made at the very outset was about the Israeli trial. The Israeli trial, you said from the Lit Club book, um, that the Israelis knew from the outset had these doubts about him. That's, that's incorrect. Uh, the Israelis did not have doubts that he was uh, Ivan the Terrible. The persons who had doubts were the American prosecutors. American prosecutors had evidence early on that uh, he wasn't Ivan the Terrible, that he was Ivan the Not So Hot. And I kind of write about it at length as to how the Americans dealt with this. And I think ultimately it was very, conf they were confused, the prosecutors. They had evidence that pointed in different directions, and you had members of the prosecutorial, of, uh, members of the OSI come along saying, no, it's clearly the case that he's Ivan the Terrible, in good faith, sincere belief. And then you had other people in the America, among the American prosecutors, good faith, sincere doubts about it. Not doubts that he was a death camp guard, just doubts about the Ivan the Terrible theory. I wanna, I wanna just, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna go last, but I just need oh. to, I wanna follow up on that question, oh. actually. Because it does seem, I mean, you're taking it very much from a legal perspective, oh. but that this case is, I'm not taking it from, I don't, I really resist, I don't think I'm taking it from. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm okay. just gonna yeah. ask. <laughs> it seems like it's um, a case fraught with politics, as any case would be, mm -hmm. and political interests. So, how can we, and can we talk about a specifically Israeli political interest still here, mm -hmm. whether they have doubts right. or whether they know for sure? Uh, we do know that the Ahmad trial, that it was very much yes. a show, and. You know, we have this movie, The Specialist, yeah. talking about how, you know, it really served a political function right. in society. It really did something mm -hmm. to Israeli society. Right. And it is 1987, yeah. and the Palestinian First Intifada is sure. starting, so that was this time. Can you, yeah, just like yeah. illuminate uh, the uh, political Yes, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. one thing, again, I would really push back on is calling the Eichmann trial or the Demyanya trial a show trial. Now, show trials mean very different things. When I hear the term show trial, I think of a Stalinist fraud. And 
That clearly was not the case of either the Eichmann trial or of the Dumyani case. Is it the case, particularly when you're dealing with these high profile mass atrocity trials, that there is an irreducible political element to these cases? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I would actually say, you know, I, I just want you to buy this book. You don't have to go back and buy the first one. But actually, this earlier book that I wrote about is exactly on, in a sense, the difference between a show trial as a fraud and a trial in which politics and history are kind of implicating every aspect of the case. And uh, I do think that, uh, and this can answer a bit also with, uh, with uh, your question, which is, did the Israeli court during the Jimmy Manier trial make mistakes? Yes, they made mistakes. And I think one of the big mistakes was it wasn't, again, that they were trying not to be fair to the Miami. But I think one of the things that I talked about was the, the dangers of turning a trial into an oral history project. And I think they were so conscious of trying to um, recognize and give uh, confer honor to the survivor witnesses that they fail to treat the survivor witnesses like you would treat ordinary witnesses in a criminal trial. You know, a lot of people know that witnesses are notoriously unreliable eyewitnesses, and the court was bent over backwards to honor these survivor witnesses for political reasons, for memorial reasons, for social reasons, cultural reasons, and that was a disastrous mistake on their part. Disastrous mistake. Okay, we're going to take two more questions. Uh, yeah, please. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, his question is really on the on a different tag. What was the reaction uh, of the family? And have, I know they had children, yeah. they had grandchildren, so forth and so on. Were there any? So were there any people who conceivably broke with him? I know probably the inner circle didn't. Yeah. To different hear the question, were you able to largely hear it? Yeah. Um, so first, with respect to the uh, the family, I would say that the um, again, I don't want to get into exactly like did his marriage survive from this thing. Uh, the uh, I would say that his children remain supporters of him, and the children uh, have remained supporters to the you know, and, and again, his children are now quite old themselves. Uh, but uh, they remained um, supportive of him, even though it's very interesting because um, uh, you listen to the statements in particular that his son made. As I said, his first line of defense has always been like, I never did any of this stuff. The son's statements, even though he continues to echo the father's claim of actual innocence, the son actually makes statements much more along the lines of kind of what you were pointing to, this idea of there was a time of war, it was a time of compromise, you know, he was taken as a prisoner of war. And what's interesting about that is, um, you know, it's a, it's a suggestion that there's a different reality that the son has come to embrace. That whole question about voluntariness that, again, that you raised, it became a really interesting thing because, you know, I think one thing we need to bear in mind is if Demyanyuk actually had made that claim in the trial, if he had actually backed off the story that he had always uh, told, the story about, look, I was, never did any of this, if he had come forward and said, look, it's true, I did it, it was a time of war, I saw lots of Soviet prisoners of war dying, I thought this was my best chance of surviving, because when I arrived at Civil War, I had no idea what kind of camp this was going to be, I was horrified when I found out what kind of camp it was, 
and um, you know, and I tried to play sick every single day. Now, he could have been lying through his teeth, but as I said, prosecutors had absolutely no evidence that uh, contradicted that. So in a sense, he made the case for the prosecutors a little bit easier, because one thing that makes no sense is it makes no sense to get up there and say, I was never there, but if I had been there, I would have been involuntarily there. <laughs> That's an incoherent position. Uh, with regard to the question about uh, Cleveland and uh, the uh, community theory, for uh, years there were basically um, various um, protests against Demyanyuk by the Jewish community and for Demyanyuk from uh, the Ukrainian community. Uh, to the point that there was actually a uh, city ordinance that was passed in that little town that he lived in. And that city ordinance ended up sponsoring a U.S. constitutional law case because the city ordinance was drafted in a way that was ultimately unconstitutional. So you can actually read it about the constitutional challenge to the city ordinance. Um, but uh, he had a decent amount of support. He had support, you know, most emphatically from uh, Pat Buchanan, the former Nixon uh, speechwriter, very, very strong supporter of Demyanya. And then also this um, Ohio congressman, James Trafficant. Yeah, Trafficant, who now whiles in federal prison. But um, uh, James Trafficant, again, he, uh, you know, I think in the case of Trafficant, he really believed that there was political advantage uh, to be called from uh, supporting Demyanya. Uh, because of, uh, there were a lot of Ukrainians in his constituency. Yeah. So yes. one last question, and then okay. we'll go down, and we can all talk to okay. Gary. Yes, sure. uh, So you talked a little bit about the logic that allowed uh, Demanek to be uh, convicted of an accessory to murder. Um, and we've seen since then um, Oscar Groening yes. being convicted on right. what I understand as sort of similar logic. Yeah. Um, and at least one more trial coming right. up. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the uh, impact that this trial had and what it sort of allowed uh, yeah. has done going right. forward? Yeah, I mean, one of the things is, I mean, you're actually right that uh, some of you might have followed this that uh, this past July, um, uh, a German court uh, in northern Germany uh, convicted this Oscar Gronick, this so-called bookkeeper of Auschwitz. Uh, and basically, they apply the theories that was pioneered in Demyanyuk. So without the Demyanyuk case, there is no Verona uh, conviction. And now they're trying to apply it with respect to another accused who I read in the paper last week, uh, this 95-year-old uh, who's now uh, facing um, trial. Now, obviously, as a result of actuarial <laughs> realities, there aren't going to be a lot of these trials. Uh, we're dealing with a very aged, uh, population of former uh, collaborators and accessories. Uh, but I do think it was kind of, I, I don't think necessarily the um, success of the Demyanyuk theory uh, needs to be measured exclusively in terms of the number of future prosecutions it ends up sponsoring, because that number will uh, perforce be small. I, I think ultimately the, um, the value of the breakthrough is really kind of what I try to argue is more of a conceptual one. That uh, really what the German prosecutors were able to do is they were really able to shape a understanding of what it means to be legally guilty when you are an accessory to a genocidal machine. And it doesn't, again, turn on personal motives or personal nastiness. It really is just a, um, a function of the actions that you performed. And I think that was a very important conceptual breakthrough. Why did it take so long? Well, that's, of course, um, the shouted out last question. Is, uh, is, uh, is the one that I write about that's such accessible right, that I'm not sure I should uh, answer here. But, um, but I think it is, I mean, it's a very important question. It's a very important question because you can certainly be somewhat cynical. You can say, isn't it odd that they only come up with the right theory for trying these characters when they're all dead? Um, yes, yes. And I think part of it is, part of it, you know, the reasons are complicated. Was there an absence of desire to go after these guys early on in the Federal Republic of Germany? Absolutely. Were there these kind of doctrinal problems? 
that were created as a result of having to shoehorn this complex history into this ordinary murder statute. Absolutely. At the same time, can you still find prosecutors who, you know, in the 60s and the 70s and 80s were engaged in a good faith effort to bring charges forward? Absolutely as well. So I think the, uh, the history is a, a pretty complicated one. And uh, certainly one can be cynical that the breakthrough came so late. On the other hand, you know, there is the whole line of, you know, better late than never. And, um, and I think there's a certain kind of um, you know, truth to that as well. So, uh, thank you. our programs to get information. We don't send a lot of emails just like once in two weeks about our program. Stay to hang out and buy the book and talk to the little ball and get me to sign the book. Thank you so much. Sorry. No, it's my friend. That was cool. I just want to look this one, okay? Rivera, say hello to my friend Jim. Jim. Nice question. I like that. Very nice. Ooh, good. Yes. Yes. Your voice was coming my way, so I was able to do it. Very convoluted. I made. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, you said there were uh, a few of the and uh, what are they called? How many other people got contacted? Is he the only one out of that whole game? I don't know, but it's just not trust. Say hi to you. It's really in the daylight, but it's terrible. I don't know if that's true. I think it's you. No, it's not. 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 Well, no, they, you know, they, uh, I mean, I, I didn't know that I was going to go through an uh, security check. I went like she in the car. Huh? Really? These days, I guess so. I get on the stairway. But I have to say, read the chapter on, uh, on, on, on Vimeo New Company. What really surprises me is he comes up with this chapter. You know, it's very circular. By the way, did I say this? Before they knew he was guilty of any pain, right? He went through hell. He had all these people in yeah. Jerusalem yelling at him. Yeah, yeah. Nobody knew who was going to be the leader. Yeah. 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 What are you know, they, they had to live in Houston. They had to find a building or something. They had to, they had to go yeah. up there and try to help the heart.